Well, alongside thinking about ministry and mission to indigenous populations, we could think about it in the context of African American Episcopalians also. In the post Civil War context, there is a mass exodus of liberated African Americans from the Episcopal Church. Uh, this is for good reason. Why stay in a church that did not fight for your liberation? So many go to newly independent Baptist and African Methodist Episcopal churches in particular. For those members who remain in the Episcopal Church, these African Americans find a very high degree of white paternalism directed towards them and segregation. So they constantly have to navigate themselves in spaces not designed for them. Immediately after the Civil War, General Convention establishes the Freedmen's Commission to bring back African Americans to the church and to attend to the needs of newly liberated people. There was a parallel Freedmen's Bureau in the federal government at the same time. The establishment of this com commission is resisted by Southern bishops who would rather prefer local control, diocesan control. So just to note, there is a tension in the Episcopal Church over centralized church control versus diocesan control that mirrors a debate in the Reconstruction era about whether the federal government will oversee life in the former Confederate states or whether states' rights and state control can be exercised. These are important parallel dynamics to attend to. In 1868, this Freedmen's Commission is renamed to distance itself from the work of the federal government, and it's now called the Commission of Home Mission to Colored People. At this point in time, I just want to acknowledge the awkwardness for myself of some of the nomenclatures used for African Americans throughout this time period. I am simply stating the uh, facts that is laid out uh, here in terms of these different uh, naming conventions. This mission to as the so-called colored people, African Americans, is disbanded in 1878 due to a number of factors. One of them is that there is a lot of African American disinterest in the efforts of the Episcopal Church because they don't seem to be actually meeting their needs. And there's a lot of uh, Southern Episcopal disinterest in this work. And note the contrast here between the relative success of evangelism among indigenous populations with the Indian Commission founded in 1871. So there's parallel dynamics happening here. Initially, there's a lot of interest in having African-American men being raised up for ordination, but then very little actually happens. So in the period from 1866 to 1877, only 20 African-Americans in total are ordained, and only two for Southern dioceses, despite the fact that most of the African-American population for the Episcopal Church resides in the Southern diocese. Why does outreach fail? Harold Lewis, in Get With a Steady Beat, offers several reasons. One is there's a little financial support. The Episcopal Church as a whole does not fund this mission. Congregations, African-American congregations, are financially dependent on white support. And there is Southern resentment over the centralized church oversight of policies for African-American Episcopalians. As a result, there's no attempt to address the structural disadvantages the African-American Episcopalians face. No discussion, say, for the exclusion of African-American parishes from the Southern diocesan conventions or church councils. No attempt to deal with the educational needs for the needs of priests and ministers. And no attempt to ameliorate um, this whole issue of the separate and un unequal life that 
African Americans are forced to endure, especially as Reconstruction comes to an end. Those who do join church as African Americans often do it as an act of social mobility. The Episcopal Church throughout its history is associated with upper class status, and both white Americans and black Americans over time have joined the Episcopal Church as a means of representing their class status and their advance in class status. And so white Episcopalians can leave behind the underclass, the white underclass, and black Episcopalians can also do the same action of leaving behind those of lower classes in the African-American context. It's also really important to note that Reconstruction ends and violence and discrimination against African-Americans increases and accelerates. And so there are many, many factors at play here that really hinder a, a larger growth than maybe what could have been for African-American Episcopalians. The end of Reconstruction sees an increase of segregation and discrimination on the state level. And we see something similar happening in Southern dioceses with a debate over jurisdiction for African Americans. There's a repeated effort to establish a separate jurisdiction for African Americans by white bishops. We see this in the proposed so-called Swanee Canon proposed at General Convention in 1883. It's called the Swanee Canon because it was formulated at, uh, in Swain, Tennessee at the University of the South. The idea is African Americans in Southern dioceses would be collected into one entire missionary diocese that would uh, overlap with any individual state diocese. And so this the idea was to provide pastoral oversight without admitting black parishes into state dioceses and state diocesan conventions. And so this would have systematically disenfranchised black parishes and have prevented any possibility of a black bishop for this jurisdiction as well. It was always meant to be a white bishop who would oversee them. So we are seeing a mirroring of the racial segregation that's happening on the civil level being attempted in the Episcopal Church. This canon is defeated under the leadership of the uh, African-American priest Alexander Cremel of St. Luke's in Washington, D.C. Southern dioceses, though, succeed in maintaining segregation by creating colored so-called convocations in their dioceses. So that they remove black congregations from the diocesan structure, from diocesan convention. They're not allowed to participate in any elections in their diocese. They're, they never serve on church bodies and they're excluded from general convention. No black Episcopalians from the South attend general convention during this time. We can see this idea summarized in Bishop Alfred Randolph of Virginia who says that these sorts of measures of creating these separate colored convocations is necessary due to the defect of intelligence, ability, and character of African Americans. So the racist reasoning is laid bare. There is a civilizing process that's happened for African Americans. Bishop Randolph and other leaders of the church do not think it's possible for them to share and the burden of governance and administration in the Episcopal Church, just as the same population was not deemed able of exercising the duties of national citizenship. So having laid all that out, what do African American Episcopalians do for themselves? We see this action really happening with a uh, a committee that's formed called the Conference of Church Workers Among Colored People, the CCWACP, that Alexander Cremel establishes in response to the Swanee Canon. He understands that if there's going to be active discrimination against African American Episcopalians in the church, 
then they need to mobilize themselves. And so he really focuses on developing clerical leadership and educational opportunities. You see that in the reading from Armin Charton Slocum that I offered to you from Alexander and Cremel, where he asks, can we alter the typical vestry system to meet the needs of African-American parishes? Do the structures envisioned by the white founders of the Episcopal Church meet the needs of our specific context? We can also see some of the dynamic at play. I linked to you on Populi uh, a series about uh, St. John the Baptist in Tyler, Texas that the uh, uh, Diocese of Texas has on their website. This is a great series about the history of African-Americans uh, in the Diocese of Texas. And just the story of the founding of St. John the Baptist and Tyler during this time period, I think gives you a window into African-American self-determination in the context of the Episcopal Church. This is also a period of time in which the Episcopal Church is helping to establish black colleges. So the establishment of historically black universities and colleges is an interesting process of cooperation between uh, white folks who want to be benefactors, perhaps allies, and African-American uplift, and African-Americans organizing themselves also to ensure that educational institutions exist in their communities. There are two remaining ones in the Episcopal Church. One is St. Augustine's College in Raleigh, North Carolina. The other is Voorhees College in Denmark, South Carolina. In 1879, the Bishop Payne Divinity School was established by Virginia Theological Seminary as a segregated seminary, and a seminary for African-American clergy. This seminary shuts down in the late 1940s. And the story of how Bishop Payne and its alumni and its holdings is integrated into the later life of Virginia Theological Seminary is very well worth exploring as well. I also gave you a reading um, by Sarah Hayward Cooper, uh, a leading female African-American leader in the Episcopal Church, where she really critiques how mission is done for African-Americans. That often it's not done with their best interest in heart, and that white leaders often don't see the real need that exists. But more importantly, that they ignore the potential that already is there in the African-American community. And in particular, she talks about the real problem of ignoring the great contributions that female African-American Episcopalians can offer, the oversight and ignoring of African-American women is an issue that Cooper speaks to repeatedly. There's a great irony that eventually the CCWACP comes to advocate in their own way for black missionary districts separate from the white thasts and structures if a black bishop could oversee it. So that some kind of representation at general convention of black interests could happen. But there is significant black opposition to this plan also. So this is a highly contentious move that never really comes to fruition. At General Convention 1907, black suffragan bishops are approved. Or really, it's appropriate to say, the concept of a suffragan bishop comes into existence so that oversight could be given to black parishes. The vote that was not allowed in the House of Bishops passes the House of Deputies. In 1910, General Convention does approve the, the election of suffragan bishops to aid in ministry. And in 1912, the Diocese of Arkansas elects Edward Thomas Demby as, quote, suffragan bishop for colored work. That same year, North Carolina elects Henry Beard Delaney for the same role. And there's a lot of tension between the CCWACP and Demby and Delaney because Demby and Delaney were seen as too close to the white power structure to be really effective advocates. So now there's a question of how does the African-American Episcopalian community advocate for itself? 
within the power structure th through these segregated bishops or externally through self-organizing processes that Cremel and others are overseeing. I've also posted for you a video uh, that Bishop Curry uh, of a sermon that B Bishop Curry gave while he was still rector, or I'm sorry, bishop in North Carolina before his election as presiding bishop. And it tells the story of Henry Beard Delaney in the Diocese of North Carolina. Now, I think it's a video worth watching. I hope we can discuss it during our discussion section because I think it speaks again to this question of how does change happen and how does full participation in the life of the church come about? In our last video, we're going to talk about women in ministry in the 19th century as a final area of focus.